Hello and welcome to a brand new Arsblog Arscast right here on Arsblog.com. How are you? Hope you're well. Thank you very much indeed, as always, for being here. It has been a really, really quiet week from an Arsenal perspective, which is often the case when there's been a defeat in the previous game. It gets a bit like radio silence, that kind of a way. But elsewhere, well, there has been one big story at Premier League level, and that, of course, is the Premier League themselves issuing over 100 charges to Manchester City for breaches of Premier League rules involving payments, finances, sponsorships, failure to provide the required documentation, etc., etc. To say this is unprecedented and seismic would be doing it a disservice, and I know a bit of time has passed. Nevertheless, it is a huge story, and it's worthy of discussion. So let's just crack on with the show, and who better to have that discussion with than our good friend, Philippe Auclair. Hello, Philippe. Hello, hello. How are you? I'm very well, thank you. Um, When this news dropped during the week about Manchester City and the Premier League charges, which accused them of all kinds of breaches of Premier League rules and beyond. Mm-hmm. You were the first name that came to my mind in terms of having, <laughs> having a conversation about this. So before we get into the depths of it, into the weeds of it, if you like, what was your reaction when you saw this drop on Monday morning? Because concerns or suspicions, if you like, about City's finances are have been fairly widely held, but the way this just dropped out of nowhere was definitely a bit of a surprise. Yes, surprise, and I would say even a measure of shock um, because of the time it had taken for anything to happen. Uh, We knew that something had been going on since uh, the latter part of 2018. There had been confirmation that there was a process in place in 2019 Then there was the decision of uh, the Court of Appeal in 2021, uh, which uh, enabled the process to continue, because you might remember that Manchester City had actually questioned whether uh, the panel that uh, the Premier League had put in place to pursue the investigation was in fact uh, legitimate and had legally the, the right to do so. And they lost that. Um, but since then, absolutely not a squeak. And um, Every time that I and my colleagues went to the Premier League to ask them, well, what exactly is happening? You know, is anything happening? Mm. We would get the same email in, in a response, which is quite amusing, I suppose, uh, which is the one they had sent for the very first uh, replies to media inquiries back in 2019, and which they literally cut and paste. And it was the standard the stock response. So I've got a collection of emails from the Premier League, which are all identical with different dates, saying that basically they couldn't possibly comment and uh, the rest of it. So I think many people were thinking, well, they're going to kick this in the long grass. Uh, It's going to take so long that in the end, nobody will really care about it. Or Mm. the longer it's it's going to take, it draws on, uh, the more difficult it's going to be to to prosecute, if that's the right word, uh, the, uh, the affair and so on and so forth. And, and and there was absolutely no sign whatsoever from the Premier League that anything was that dramatic was going to happen, um, which in itself is very telling. Mm. And um, what is also very telling is that Manchester City discovered uh, that decision pretty much at the same time as we did, in the form of, I think, a career went to uh, their stadium or their HQ and delivered the news. And at about the same time, the statement appeared on the Premier League website and we were all going, my goodness, what the hell is going on? I mean, can you just sort of expand on that bit very, um, very quickly? Because, you know, football is a, it's a big industry, but it's a relatively small, closed industry as well. And very often with things like this, there's sort of advance warning. I don't know if it's like a collegiate sort of, um, mindset, you know, you get the heads up, this is what's coming down the road. How significant is it that Manchester City were caught on the hop in the way that they were? Because it, t- it took them, 
you know, a few hours to respond to this. Normally, something like this happens, and almost immediately there's a club statement, you know, coming out to deny, confirm, whatever it might be, because the club and their legal teams have had time to prepare. But in this case, that that, that doesn't seem to be what happened. No, uh, that wasn't the case. Um, and I agree, it is um, unusual uh, I would say even unprecedented for something to happen like this to happen and to happen in such a way. I think, and it's only my reading of it, that uh, the Premier League uh, wanted to keep a lid on the proceedings uh, that would be as tight as possible to avoid uh, any complications, legal complications uh, in the future, mm. in which in some ways uh, Manchester City and and their lawyers, and heaven knows they've got plenty of lawyers on their books, and not the worst, or not the most, the least efficient, uh, would say that the case was compromised because there had been leaks. And, you know, so I mm. think there was a, it shows that there was a will from the Premier League to keep things under wraps as long as possible until the very last second, which I think is indicative of the seriousness of the investigation. That's the way I read it, and I can't see how you could read it any other way. Um, if indeed it had been a, a kind of cosmetic operation uh, and a kind of, if they had been in cahoots with Manchester City, as some people perhaps believe they were, uh, all of this would have been done quite differently. Uh, mm. it, it showed that the process had been followed absolutely independently from, from the club. So that in itself was very telling and I think is indicative of the seriousness of the approach mm. it, it's not i mean it's and w which also is obvious when you read the the list of charges the 115 charges which have been made and and we know more or less what they refer they refer to even if it's not spelled out uh in uh, the premier league statement mm. but we have a very good idea that it's all related to what started with the publication of the football leagues what happened with the, the spiegel and then the UEFA, uh, of course, situation, uh, the two-year ban from the champion for comp European competitions, the appeal to TAS and to CAS, sorry, using French here, um, and which, by the way, must have informed the way uh, that the Premier League went about its business. I think they were very aware of what happened when UEFA did its own process, and it all collapsed in the end. Yeah, and I thought, well, we're not going to do anything like this. We're going to do things our way. And um, because there had been leaks when it comes to, to UEFA, I mean, uh, I think, you know, things had been leaked. I don't know if they had been leaked to the media, but things that uh, somehow, you know, we had a, an idea of where UEFA was heading, and um, which is completely different in this case. And I think the Premier League is very, very, very aware of that situation and doesn't want to have egg on their faces like UEFA had, uh, because they they should quite lack of competence, it must be said, in the way they pursued thing, to the extent that uh, they didn't even realize or mm. that you know some of the charges they had pressed against uh, against Manchester City were in fact um, uh, under the statute of limitations could not even be uh, used basically. So. But there is no statute of limitations, by the way, in the Premier League uh, financial fair play and rules and regulations in, in general. There is no such thing. So this is not going to happen this time. Yeah. But to get back to what you were saying, yes, I think it's indicative of the seriousness of the process and the fact that they do mean business. Just to give people a bit of background on the UEFA thing, because I, I guess it might have slipped from people's minds or consciousness that they did face this two-year ban from the Champions League, and they were issued with a very hefty fine, which, of course, you know, is relative when you're a club like Manchester City and you're owned um, by some of the deepest pockets in the world. A fine feels a bit irrelevant, and maybe that's something we'll touch on when we talk about potential outcomes or punishments in terms of this. But going back to the leaks in Der Spiegel, uh, the football leaks, um, which led to this decision by UEFA, which of course was overturned by the Court of Arbitration for Sport, it wasn't a case that they found the uh, the charges were without merit or anything like that. But as you say, <clears throat> there was a statute of limitations that there was a, a time element to this, 
which Ooh. meant they felt they couldn't implement the punishment, not because of, in inverted commas, innocence, but simply because of how much time had passed. Yes, and that's a very important point. Um, obviously, we cannot, uh, I mean, presume of what the conclusion is going to be of this particular process and innocent until proven guilty and all these sort of things. Uh, but, um, you know, we have, and, and City have obviously denied that there was, they behaved in any uh, improper way and so on and so forth. Of course. Now, now that we've covered our backs, we can talk about it. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and uh, we know that it's linked to the payment uh, of, uh, uh, for example, the payment of part of the, uh, very important part, by the way, uh, of uh, uh, Roberto Mancini's salary mm. um, under the cover, or so it is alleged, of uh, payments paid uh, by an Emirati club uh, called Al Ahad, for which Mr. Mancini was supposedly doing a consultancy of a few days uh, a year and was paid, I think the figure was $1.75 million uh, to a company in, in Italy, um, and um, which had linked to, to Mauritius as well. Mm. But that, in fact, uh, Al Had hadn't paid that money, and it was money that was coming from Manchester City uh, indirectly. So, because we were kind of bad channel, sure. uh, that is the allegation, at least. So, that's one one of the elements, and and one of the crucial ones, because that would constitute, if proven, uh, an obvious and glaring uh, attempt at uh, going around circumventing the fair play regulations, and actually a, a very very serious breach. Um, I mean you know, almost quasi-fraudulent, I would say, um, mm -hmm. again, if proven. And um, that was one of the elements. And, and there were others linked to uh, uh, financial incentives given to uh, people who were in charge of taking, well, looking after the interest of uh, players who were minors at the time. So a bit of a skullduggery uh, in, in the recruitment of young players. Mm -hmm. uh, and also uh, the total lack of cooperation from uh, from the club uh, in the investigation. Um, and, uh, you know, we could carry on like that for, for a very long time. Uh, the charges are, you know, it's all there on the internet if you want to look at it. I think Nick Harris of the Mid on Sunday has uh, done a sterling job in uh, yeah. reporting on that. Martin Ziegler of the Times as well. Um, so there, there is, um, all the material is, is out there. And I, not absolutely sure that there is much in the charges against Manchester City, which is new, with one exception, which is um, actually um, the uh, lack of cooperation from the club in passing on the information that uh, the regulations say they should be uh, make available to the Premier League uh, to pursue the investigation process. And so a lack of cooperation, mm. which obviously is uh, something that uh, is disputed by Manchester City again, but certainly raised a few uh, amused eyebrows in, in the microcosm when, when we read the statement the club made. They, they haven't exactly been cooperating as fully, perhaps, as uh, they should have. And I don't think many people can, can doubt that. So, in a way, it's the same old story, um, uh, which is not that old, to be honest, uh, but with, with knobs on. Yeah. And uh, in a completely different legal uh, uh, legal context, uh, because there's one very important element, uh, and I'm pretty sure of that, uh, is the fact that decisions taken by the disciplinary uh, panel of the Premier League, if and when they come, well, you won't be able to appeal to, to TAS mm. uh, about them, which is, of course, a, a very, 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 very significant difference. And one of the reasons why I'm, I'm sure that people are pretty nervous, um, you know, at the city of Manchester Stadium. For sure. And, you know, I think that was a very telling uh, aspect to the charges. You know, Manchester City in their statement said they provided irrefutable evidence um, that will clear their name. And, and basically the Premier League statement is saying, well, you haven't given us uh, on a consistent basis. You have not provided us with the required documentation. Um, yeah. So, so when we think about this, and when we sort of step back from it a bit and look, I don't know that too many people listening to this or too many football fans would look for their fainting couch when somebody says <laughs> maybe maybe Manchester City have not been uh, playing by the rules, right? Um, right. I, I don't think there'd be too many football fans, and maybe even Manchester City fans who would go, well, there's a turn up for the books. However, the Premier League 
is a very um, brand conscious organization. Yep. And what they're doing here is essentially charging their most successful club over the last decade, basically. I think City have won ten ti- or six titles in the last 10 years, something like that. They're basically charging them with behaving in a way that's in contravention of the rules and that, if proven, would significantly damage the sporting integrity of the Premier League. Because yep. it's not to say that Manchester City have not been a brilliant football team because they have. It's not to say they haven't been consistent because they have. It's just how have they built that consistency? How have they built that quality? They've done it in a way which, if these things are proven, is in contravention of the rules that every other football club in the Premier League has had to abide by. So, in essence, the titles, whether they strip Man City or not or whatever, the Premier League are saying, we will charge you and we are going to like basically say your, your titles are tainted because yeah. the sporting integrity of this competition has been damaged. To me, that's really interesting because... Like I said, they're very brand conscious. There's a lot of money in the Premier League. There's a lot of glitz and glamour. A lot of things happen at Premier League level and at Premier League clubs that aren't always um, great. But in the in the show must go on or we've got a, a beautiful, attractive Friday night football, Sunday night football package to give to you, um, you know, it is all about the product, all about the product of the Premier League. And this might be the first time, I think, that I can remember anyway, that, that the Premier League as an organization is is not doing itself damage, because I think if it's proven there are benefits, and obviously there are benefits that we can talk about, you know, about how the organization is run and how football is run, et cetera, et cetera. But, you know, it is it is fascinating to think that they are going to say, well, these guys didn't do it right, and we're going we're gonna to hold them to account for that. Yes, Um it is perhaps for me the most fascinating uh, aspect of this. It's I, I'm I'm thinking a bit like uh, uh, a club telling uh, its star player or its manager nobody is bigger than the club, mm. you know. Yeah. And the Premier League saying, well, nobody is bigger than the Premier League. The Premier League is a limited company uh, which has got 21 shares, one shares for the one share for the FA, but doesn't have voting rights apart from anything other than the competition itself, the rules of the competition, mm-hmm. and 20 shares, which each of which uh, uh, is given to whoever happens to be in the top flight on, in that particular season. That's the way it works, which is a very unique way, by the way, of uh, running a league. It's uh, quite unusual. Mm-hmm. And so they're, they're actually uh, getting after one of their shareholders. But the thing is, one of 20 uh, and I, I'm not sure that there's going to be an awful lot of sympathy from the other 19 shareholders, first no. of all, if you see what I mean. I do. Uh, second thing is that uh, the Premier League is, is faced with a dilemma. And, and you know, I wrote about it and I said, it's basically a question of which gun am I going to shoot and which food? Uh, because <laughs> whichever way you look at it, uh, there's going to be damage. And the question is... Uh, the scar, which scar will heal the fastest, the quickest. Mm. And, but it's a, it's a very clear sign of, of the way that, that it is an organization that does have its own independence and that it, it's a very strong message sent to those clubs which believe perhaps that they're bigger than the Premier League. Uh, it's a, a, a reminder that it is uh, an organization which takes its decisions uh, with a majority of two thirds, for example, in which the voice of Bournemouth has got as much weight as that of Liverpool FC. Mm. Um, all of these things. But it's true that I, 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 it's not being the uh, devil's advocate, but I, I would say that should, and again, this is all conditional and innocent until proven guilty and all these other things, but should Manchester City be um, sanctioned uh, by a, a, a very hefty sanction, uh, which goes way beyond the fine because the fine would be meaningless. Um, it would send a message which in some ways would be ex- extremely positive uh, about the league. Do you think Say, it's potentially we, a warning shot across the bows of Newcastle? Um, across well, other other clubs who have 
very wealthy owners. And look, Arsenal are a club with wealthy owners, but I think there is a slight difference in that sense as you read about what might be coming down the line at Manchester United, what potentially might be coming down the line at Liverpool. Is this a sort of stake in the ground, if you like, for the ownership, the state of ownership in in the Premier League? One would hope so. Um, The fact that this has been dragging on since 2018... Uh, long before Newcastle became Saudi-owned, long before uh, we learned that Man Man United and and Liverpool were basically up for sale and there was interest from people from the Middle East in particular, which which would mean more state intervention, um, without a doubt. Uh, It's it's correlated, but correlation is not necessarily causation. Um, Mm. It, it certainly will have this effect. So that, for example, investors who are thinking of coming into the Premier League will, if indeed this process ends up with City being sanctioned very heavily, will think, okay, so this is the way things work. This is how we've got to, to you know, to, to do our job ourselves, do our business. Um, so you could say, yes, that in, in a way it's a stake which is planted in the ground. Um, the same way that you could say that we should remember that the Premier League in, in the first instance didn't want uh, the, the Saudis to take control of Newcastle. I think people have forgotten about that, that it took a very long time. Remember how some Newcastle fans were incensed by the fact that Ashley was not uh, able to sell uh, the club to, uh, to the Saudis when they first came on the scene and how the first deal actually completely collapsed when everybody thought it was going through. Mm. And it was because the Premier League... Uh, you know, basically decided uh, or said at the time that we can't, we cannot have a nation state being directly, uh, you know, the owner of of one of our clubs. We can't have that. Then things changed, and perhaps there was a little bit of political pressure uh, applied in the United Kingdom. It's possible, um, <laughs> but it's, it's so in in that way, it's not totally unprecedented. But it it, it is a, a decision of such colossal impact that um, it will certainly change the perception of the Premier League abroad. And that's why I'm coming back to that. I don't think it's necessarily a bad thing at all for the Premier League, even if there's going to be some collateral damage. Because, come on, if you, if you decide to, uh, to punish a club which has you know, brought players like um, Kun Aguero and Yaya Torre and Kevin De Bruyne uh, to the Premier League and, uh, and David Silva... And Erling Haaland, uh, you're depriving yourself of a, a financial uh, behemoth, uh, which is which has played a, a big part in establishing the Premier League as being the global uh, football league in the world. Mm. And they have played a key role in that. Uh, they haven't been the only uh, actors, obviously, but you know, they, 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 it's also uh, it's also Pep Guardiola's Manchester City. The fact that the Premier League has got the most prestigious, most um, while capable and brilliant managers of, of any competition and that it is the destination of choice. And City have been part of that uh, growth. They, they were not the originators. Uh, it, it, Premier League had already got that status before they, they actually uh, you know, won that, that title uh, with Roberto Mancini. Uh, but still, it, it's... it's um, it is a very. It, it, it's like a yeah a, a, a production company firing its, uh, its its star actor from a mega production mm. and saying and saying well I'm ter- terribly sorry but you you, know, you you went past the line there and we've got to do something about it. So yes, it is indicative of a of a, a will to uh, to draw perhaps some more. Uh, precise rules. Perhaps it is also to be seen in parallel with what we hope would be uh, a reform of regulation uh, in English football, uh, that famous white paper that we've all been waiting for for so long, and perhaps even an independent independent uh, regulatory body imposed on, on football, all these sort of things. Mm. Perhaps it's a, it's a show of strength for the Premier League saying, you know, you're telling us that we need a regulator. Well, look at us. You know, we're really we're regulating. We're ser- we're serious about that. You know, when we have to punish somebody, well, we, at least we try. If we think somebody is uh, is guilty of infringement, 
we will, you know, we'll have a good look at it, and and you can trust us to do that. So you can also see it, yes, in this political light, perhaps. Yeah, I mean that's that's such an interesting way to look at it as well, because to do what they've done to spend four years investigating and basically. You know, like you talked about at the start, when people are inquiring, when journalists and media are looking for some information, they're playing it down, they're giving you the stock response, despite the fact that behind the scenes there's obviously a lot going on. And they're in a position now where they've completed that investigation. They've made the charges. It is hugely public. There must be a significant amount of confidence at the Premier League that they have the evidence to make these charges stick to the point where some measure of punishment is is issued to Manchester yeah. City, because otherwise they look kind of stupid and toothless, right? And that that's in my, in my mind, this is the most serious danger for the Premier League as a whole. Is that if this was going to be a, a one of those petards that never uh, explodes or you know blow mm. off properly. Um, they would find themselves in a very embarrassing situation. People would say, you look at that, if anything goes, uh, they're all in cahoots anyway. It was all uh, a public relations operation. They did it because they had to do it. Once they had started the ball rolling, the ball had to roll until the end, but look where it stopped. Um, so, I mean, you yeah, could it, under- it, 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 it would be, I mean, it would be I mean, incredibly negative uh, sure. for the Premier League if it were to come to nothing. You could understand, though, why people who live in the world we live in today, and this is not just applicable to football, but the more money you have, the more you can get away with. And I know that's mm-hmm. not a new um, a new thing by any stretch of the imagination. That's just the way, unfortunately, very unfortunately, it's the way the world works, you know, in business, mm-hmm. in politics, in sport, that you, if you have money, if you have power, if you have the ability to you know, pay lawyers to drag things out, to obfuscate, to just kick the can down the road and down the road and down the road to the point where, you know, either the other party runs out of resources or they just get fed up. You can understand why people might look at this and think, well, look, nothing is going to happen because nothing ever happens. So I think that's another part of another part of what the Premier League have got to contend with here. And, and certainly when it comes to, the denouement, if you like, if these things are, I don't know if proven is the right word, but if City are found guilty by this independent commission, then the punishment side of things is going to be absolutely fascinating because you can Hmm. look and see, you know, what happened to Juventus. I know it's a different scenario, but look at what happened to Juventus with the Calciopoli thing. Look at what's happening to Juventus now. Um, I, I do wonder if there might be administrators in other leagues, um, one maybe a bit close to your home who might be looking at, <laughs> at this and thinking, hey, you know what? Let's have a look at some of the sponsorship deals that are going on in in Paris, for example. Just plucking it out of, out of the air. Yeah, but, right, just to, yeah, yeah, you know, but... Example at random. Yeah, exactly. But, but the punishment, like you said, it can't be a fine. What is the point in fining Manchester City or, or any club that is owned by... Uh, a nation state or even by a billionaire a uh, hundred times over because a fine is just, well, look, we'll, we'll pay that money and there might be, you know, a, a slight inconvenience to it, but nothing beyond that. So when it comes to punishment, the range of options that have been doing the rounds from points deductions to stripping of titles to uh, relegation, all of these kinds of things they seem to me to be very much front and center that if the seriousness we've talked about, about how the Premier League are approaching this and how they feel like they need to deal with this, that also has to be present in the punishment too. And again, if the commission decides that City have a case to answer, the the actual judgment, the punishment, if you like, is going to be, is going to be so interesting. Yes. And Given the number of charges and the seriousness of charges, it's almost impossible to think that it could only be a fine. Um, mm. The, I mean, I think you likened that a fine to uh, basically a, a, a car park ticket. You know, uh, you know, you mm. pay it and then you carry on parking the car. You don't care mm-hmm. because it's nothing. 
And, I, and for me, I, I, I thought it's a bit like, uh, uh, it, it would be like, a bit like a, the tip given by a successful blank, you know, uh, gambler in the casino uh, to the croupier after he's just broken <laughs> the bank. You know, it, it, it makes absolutely no sense. So if it were just that, which I suppose would be a way to obfuscate, uh, I think people would be up in arms about it. And, and the image of the Premier League would be seriously damaged. Um, Point deduction, completely possible, uh, just like what's happened to Juve, even though the process there is quite different. In, in, mm. Because Juve are in the trouble they're in at the moment, and believe me, they're only starting to discover what kind of trouble they are, because they, they are, there, are, there is more to come. Um, I've been you know, hit with 15 points deduction, but that was actually something which came from the law, law enforcement agencies to start with. That's completely different in the case of City, uh, for, for example, because what what is reproached to you, they has got a criminal dimension, and nobody is suggesting at this point in time that what is reproached to Manchester City has a criminal d- dimension. Mm. Uh, that, that that's a very important, I think, um, distinction to be made. Um, but yes, points deduction, uh, exclusion, uh, which means relegation to Championship or even the lower level of of football, which would be fascinating to see how it could be implemented. By the way, because that would complicate matters some, somewhat mm. in terms of promotion and relegation of other clubs. You've got to think about that. Sure. Um, and also, what the other dimension, which is nobody uh, that I, I, I talked about, is the implications for Manchester City globally. Manchester City is only one club in the City Football Group, uh, which controls clubs everywhere on the planet. You know, in Australia, in Uruguay, in Japan, uh, in Spain. Uh, in the US, and we could carry on like that for, in India, uh, we, we could carry on like that for a long time. So the, the damage would be absolutely colossal because Manchester City is, is the locomotive, it's the engine of this project, which is a global project, uh, which extends to uh, all confederations. You can imagine the, the, the re- impact it would have on the rest because uh, th- that's why, you know, I, I guess they must be very, very nervous about that because the project is, is, is colossal. I mean, in with, terms of them, yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, with all due respect to the other clubs that they own, uh, is the incentive to like if this was a group wide issue, it doesn't strike me that the the incentive is quite the same um, for the other clubs because of the the leagues that they're in. With with all due respect to them, the financial. Uh, aspects of success aren't quite the same and and obviously the prestige and and you know we've gone through this entire conversation without mentioning the word sports washing which is you know part and parcel of of Manchester City I think everybody understands that but it's because of the prestige of the Premier League that it's more important yeah it is um but but I, but I still think that it would have a, a global impact because the expansion of the City Football Group is not something that has stopped. Mm. Uh, they've just gone into a relationship with Bahia uh, in Brazil. So you can see how they're trying to put their, you know, it's they're putting the, the pawns on the board and, mm. and adding. Uh, it's perhaps more like go than, than chess. So you put more stones on the board as, as you go on. Sure. Uh, uh, and, and it would have a huge impact because you could imagine in other leagues, people might say, you know, especially other clubs might say, you know, guys, you know, we, we're enabling these people to buy clubs in our leagues. We're enabling them to, um, you know, spend millions and millions and have all these agreements about transferring player from one market to the next, et cetera, et cetera. And that's not fair. Look at what's happened to them in England. These guys have broken the rules and we are enabling them to carry on doing their business as if nothing happened. Mm. It, it has got... And in terms of, yes, sports washing, even though Manchester City always claim that they are privately owned by Sheikh Mansour and the Abu Dhabi United and his Abu Dhabi United group, we all know that he's the, the brother of the president uh, of the United Arab Emirates. We know he's a vice prime minister. We know he's the minister of presidential affairs. Uh, to all intents and purposes, uh, it is a club which is owned uh, by by Abu Dhabi. Um, uh, you know, uh, they, they would... Con- that they would say, and Manchester City fans get absolutely berserk when you say that. Uh, but you know, the, the relationship is so close as, as they almost that there's no difference whether mm. it's owned by the state or by Sheikh Mansour. Um, so we, we all know that. So, it, yeah, it would be uh, uh, also 
uh, a it would also perhaps make people who are into this kind of sports washing for whichever reasons and they may vary uh, think twice about the way they're going to go about their business yeah. certainly in England which is you know one of the things that uh, some people have been saying people who are you know quite favorable shall we say to Manchester City and their project is that this would act as a deterrent and um, and would actually uh, imperil the financial investment in one of the few truly world leading uh, businesses in in the United Kingdom uh, there, there aren't that many as you're aware mm. and but this one is and uh, and you think well what about if you punish you know the most successful of all your clubs the, you know who are bringing all this money in who have now been twice uh, uh, designated the richest club in the world by by Deloitte are now ahead of Real Madrid in Barcelona and have this <laughs> phenomenal, you know, anti -quote, which is quite extraordinary. Uh, they've got the best commercial department in the world. There's absolutely no doubt about that. They sure do. Uh, yeah, they sure do. <laughs> and they know how to convince these people, who strangely enough come, come also mostly from the United Arab Emirates, but that's just a coincidence. Um, and, uh, yeah, I mean, it, it, it certainly would have consequences for that. And... Uh, uh, because there is, you know, there is a sports washing uh, reputational uh, side to that. But uh, City has been run, always has been run from the very beginning, also like a, a very, very serious business. And we might not be too happy about the way the business is run. We might think that some of their practices are not quite fair. We might think that, well, they probably overstepped the mark or they said to have overstepped the mark in such a, a, a consistent fashion that they are facing uh, extreme sanctions. Um, but they are run absolutely superbly from a business point of view. Mm -hmm. uh, and nobody, nobody denies that. And that the aim, uh, there's also an economic aim. There's a diplomatic aim. There's a reputational aim. All of this. Uh, and, and this uh, would, uh, I would say it would put an end to the city project, but it would certainly force them to have a very serious rethink about how they go about this part of their business. Just very finally then, I know it's a near impossible question because these things are going to play out in private. Yep. The Premier League have said the next thing, you know, the next statement we will make will be the um, the, the judgment, if you like. Um, so you're going to send emails, and they're going to send you back the the stock email, and and that might go on for <laughs> that might go on for some time. But I mean, do you think there is a from the Premier League's point of view, anyway? a need for this how do you find the balance i should say between getting this done right and getting this done in such a a timely fashion that it feels like um or it doesn't look like you're sort of as we keep saying kicking the can down the road because city are going to fight this obviously city can afford very very good lawyers the premier league can afford very good lawyers um this could well turn into something that plays out for, for quite a long time, but I suspect the Premier League would like this to be adjudicated as quickly as possible. Yes, the time scale element is crucial. And what I'm hearing from various uh, parts of the Premier League, various clubs, is that they want a very swift resolution. Uh, the investigation, as you said, is done. Now it's a question of evaluating the results of this investigation, listen to their arguments, uh, and for the disciplinary panel to um, issue its judgment. And what I'm hearing is that a number of clubs want this decision to be taken before the end of this season. Mm. Uh, because there is also a risk to the sporting integrity, uh, which, is, which is true. It, should they be found guilty of these breaches, People will say, well, come on, uh, you know, we, we can't wait three, four years for that. We can't wait as long as we've waited in the past uh, for anything to happen. We need to have quick results because, you know, we've got to conduct our business. We've got to carry on playing games. Uh, what's going to happen at the moment? They're the only club which seems to be in a position to, to challenge Arsenal for the title. And hooray. Mm. Um, and uh, so what happens if, uh, say... Uh, God forbid, uh, they won the league by three points and they were then subjected to a 20 points deduction afterwards. 
that title that would give that could go Arsenal away and then to that mm. inshallah um, would would be not tainted but it would be devalued wouldn't it that's that's ridiculous mm. it's not a situation that can and also it has it has obviously consequences and very important consequences imagine imagine for a second right you're you're Brentford or Brighton okay you're having a fabulous season and you manage and it's not unthinkable at all to finish fifth in the league okay. an amazing achievement Europa League bravo splendid well done guys two months later City is hit with a retrospective points deduction and Brentford find themselves fourth. But it's too late for them to play in the Champions League. Mm. Can you imagine the damage? I mean, the damage it does to a Brentford or Brighton or whatever. Sure. Or Newcastle, you know, I mean, might not like them, but, you know, or anybody who finishes fifth and suddenly thinks, well, you know, I, I should be playing this Champions League. I should be getting all this money, all this exposure. I would be able to attract players who want to play in that competition. And because you've, uh, you know, you've been so slow in going to a decision after spending four years investigating, you know, we're deprived of this and there's nothing that can compensate for it. Mm. I mean, I think that's a very strong point, isn't it? I, I mean, for, yeah. for, for clubs to push and say, we've got to be aware of that. Similar thing, imagine that, they imagine that the um, decision taken, let's say, in October 2023, uh, was that the offenses are so serious that we disarm the relegation. What happens to the club that finished 18th in the Premier League? Or the club that finished, you know, 7th in the Championship and didn't get into the playoffs or whatever Exactly. It is. So, I mean, exactly. you're, I mean what, what, we're, what we're talking about here is in essence, the, the sporting integrity that should be at the heart of all this, like whatever you think about fines, whatever you think about, you know, the money side of it, what it boils down to is sporting integrity. And that then must Completely. be applied to the process in how this uh, decision is reached. Yes. And which is one reason why everybody should be pushing for that. And, uh, and by the way, if Manchester City uh, are innocent of the charges uh, that they are accused of, uh, that's also what they should be wishing for because mm. they don't want this to carry on and on and on and on. Because imagine, you know, you come, uh, I can carry on this. Actually, this is a very interesting way of, of looking at it, which again, hasn't been really in the debate about this uh, announcement. Uh, imagine that uh, you are, uh, you arrive at a summer market, whatever, and you're trying to get players in, you're Manchester City, you're trying to get Jude Bellingham in. Mm. And you're dangling that carrot, we're, we won this title, you know, we're in the Champions League, blah, 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 blah. And, and suddenly that player, uh, four months later, finds out that, oh, shit, I'm in the Championship. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's that, it, it, it would be, and also, when would it implement it? I mean, this is, you know, the, the mind boggles as to how uh, it, it should be put in place. And it has to be uh, a, a decision which uh, will I I impact both the club and the league and everybody else, and also the the English Football League, mm. pr probably you know in, in in June or July, so that people have time to prepare because for for what is going on. And UEFA also has got to you know uh, because it's up. Uh, I think so the, the FA is the organisation that decides which clubs. You know, we all know it's the first four, the fifth, blah, blah, all these sort of things, the winner of the FA Cup, blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. But it's still up to the FA to designate the clubs, to say to the UEFA, these are the clubs which, uh, from our country, which will take part in your competitions next year. This is the way it works. So the FA, too, will want this to happen quickly. Everybody will want it to happen quickly. Mm. And uh, the fact that, which might help up with the speeding up of the decision, is the fact that, obviously, as far as I understand it, and I don't think I'm wrong, this is not a matter that can be brought to the Court of Arbitration for Sport. Mm -hmm. So that should speed up the process. Well, it is going to be absolutely fascinating oh, yeah. to see how this plays out. Um, you know, I, I guess you know what will happen is we'll get a bombshell in the same way that we got a bombshell when the charges were we're level yep. to get a bombshell when it comes to uh, to the decision. So maybe we'll catch up at that point, Philippe, and uh, have a, another discussion about what the implications are on that ruling. But for now, we better leave it there. Thank you very much as always. Thank you.
Thank you very much indeed to Philippe. You can find him on Twitter. He is at Philippe Auclair, at Philippe Auclair. Now, if Philippe wasn't enough talking about Man City, how about a little more? Not of Philippe and not all about Manchester City, but I'm delighted to welcome back to the show Andrew Allen. Hello, Andrew. Hello there. We just talked to Philippe about Man City, the club, what might happen and all the rest of it. But I suppose we could talk a little bit about Man City, the team. And given the state of play, given the upcoming fixture, given what's at stake for the rest of this season, do you do you think at all that what what has happened or the Premier League charges or, or this cloud that might be hanging over Man City will have any impact on them as a team? Oh, I don't know. I don't know that it will necessarily. Um I mean, it's not as if they as players are being accused of anything. Sure, the the, the wider entity is. Um, there's something not quite right about City at the moment anyway. I think people can kind of see that, maybe the body language and the fact that, you know, if you're a casual observer and you tune in to watch a game and you see Kevin De Bruyne on the bench, you're probably scratching your head and asking, why is that the case? Yeah. Um, er- Erling Haaland isn't kind of scoring goals and quite the rate he was at the beginning of the season. Again, you might be wondering why that is. Um, but I can't, I, I don't know. These things kind of go two ways, don't they, sometimes? I mean, I, was it years ago when Italy won the, the, the World Cup in 2006, was it? And that was against the backdrop of the Calciopoli stuff and everybody kind of suggesting that Italian football was corrupt and all the rest of it. And it kind of galvanised them, really, as a as a national team. Um, uh yeah, I, I, I'm not expecting City to be kind of overly like frustrated by it. I think a backs against the wall thing for them right now might be the exact type of th- you know atmosphere that Guardiola is trying to um, you know foster to try and get something out of them. But yeah. it'll be interesting to see whether people press him on his previous assertion that I think he said he you know he would he wouldn't stick around if he felt like the club had misguided him when it came to the way that he was you know receiving his cash. So. Um, mm. I mean, I hope it, obviously, I hope it completely, <laughs> you know, throws them off and that they just throw in the towel and give up and, you know, cease to, you know, exist as a, an entity. But, you know, I can't see it happening. It's wishful yeah. thinking at this point. I sort of wonder, though, about, you know, that, that siege mentality that you, you talk about, which we all know can be really valuable in football. Um, I think Mikel Arteta has done a job at Arsenal in a similar way without the kind of uh, the enormity of something like this that's that's going on at Manchester City. But I also wonder if at the heart of it, you have to really feel like you've been done an injustice for that to work, you know? And, yeah. and in this case, like... I don't want to label all footballers with the same brush, but I think there are actually some smart people at, at Man City, some smart players, some some people who must understand what the wider implications of City as a football club, the City group, you know, why they've got into English football, all that kind of stuff. I know they can very easily compartmentalize that because they'll just say, well, I'm here to play football. I'm here to win things. Uh, you know, I don't care about all of that stuff. That's the easy way. But like, you know, they must, some of them must think about it at some point. So I just wonder if, you know, that, that, that might be absent from the way that they react to this, if that's something that he tries to engender, uh, you know, in, in the coming weeks and months. Yeah, I mean, I was just trying to think if there were any other examples. I guess, you know, Chelsea were in a, a, a fair amount of, uh, well, there was... <laughs> a complete lack of stability at Chelsea last year off the back of everything that was going on with Roman Abramovich and the conversations and the narrative and the press and the way that everybody was kind of talking about them. And it felt like their day-to-day existence was kind of on a knife edge and all the rest of it. I mean, I don't think it's anywhere quite as dramatic as that as Mm. with City right now, because it feels like the timeline while unknown is likely to be much longer. I definitely think for City, trying to plan ahead is going to be more difficult because, you know, you may have transfer targets 
and people that you were talking to and thinking about trying to bring to the Etihad in the summer who would be looking at the situation and going, well, you know, maybe I'll hold out, see how this plays out because mm. I don't know where you're going to be. I don't want to join a side that suddenly finds themselves relegated or unable to compete for a championship or not able to, you know, play at the highest level or whatever. Uh, and I guess some of the players could be thinking that further down the line. Oh, you know, why would we bother going for the Champions, you know, mm. Champions League or the Championship if we can't, you know, if we don't know what's going to happen in a couple of years' time? But at the same time, I just think that when they get on the football pitch, they're going to be as competitive as ever. So long as they're, you know, I think when you look at them, they're not quite as strong as they have been. I look at certain areas of their squad at the moment and I do look at them and think, there's a little bit of a state of flux going on. Like they've got good young players kind of on the fringes of things, but when you watch them on the pitch, you think that's a good potential player, Mm. but there are mistakes there and you can go and target that person. And I was looking, is it that Rico Lewis kid who was playing the other day, Mm. really tidy, beautiful footballer. But the fact that he's on the pitch and getting regular game time at the moment for me says that, you know, Arsenal got to go target that person. I mean, I thought Trossard was good against him the other day in the FA Cup game. And I think if he moves over to the other side, which I think he was playing um, against Spurs, mm. Saka would give him a, a game all day long. So there's there's opportunities there. I just, I, uh, I really, I, I mean, I really hope that the book is thrown at City. Not because I have anything, you know, really against Guardiola or this set of players, or even the fact that, you know, we're, dead against them in a, in a title race right now. I just want them to pay for the fact that they have been hiding the fact that they have been bending the rules, allegedly. Yes. But all of the evidence suggests that that's exactly what's been going on, and it's been going on for a bloody long time. And everybody else has had to sit here and sort of listen to them saying, oh, we're not doing anything wrong. And it just really pisses me off. Like, it's been in plain sight for a long time. And I know that the Premier League have been sitting on this for a while and we don't know exactly why the timing of it has come out right now. It may be because they're trying to show that they themselves can regulate the game in which they seem to have such a huge kind of control over um, because obviously there's all sorts of other talk about an independent regulator and all the rest mm. of it. But um, yeah, I just I just think that now that the you know we can see what's happening and everybody the evidence is there and people have known about it for a long time, it's now time for them to you know face face the face the punishment. Some men um, just want to watch the world burn, and you're one of those. <laughs> <laughs> Some men do. Um, I, uh, but you understand why, right? Of course, you can understand why after of all course. of this time. It feels like they need to, you know, they need a more than a slap on the wrist. Yes, like there's, there's no point. And we talked about this, you know, with Philippe that, you know, when it comes to the punishment, it's got to fit the crime. Um, so, yeah, it, it will all play out in the end. And you know, I think the interesting part of this, you know, between now and May is obviously the battle between us and them, and maybe even Manchester United for the title. Um, I know they've got a. A couple of games, uh, played a couple of games more, but you can't necessarily rule them out of it given the the points and the amount of games that are are left to play. So it'll just be interesting to see if it affects them on the pitch. I mean, talking of finances and talking of clubs who are thinking in monetary terms, we got news today of a reboot of our old friend, this isn't trying to piss you off again because I know how exercised you got about this last time, is the the European Super League with Barcelona, Real Madrid, Juventus <laughs> in it again. You know what? Like, there's this part of me that that thinks is a bit like, um, you know, when Sky were up in arms and Gary Neville was up in arms about the European Super League and about you know, the, the, taking away the soul of football and all that kind of stuff. And then, you know, you're going, well, hang on a second. You're, you're working for, you're working for Sky. You're working for the company that has basically turned the Premier League into a money factory, et cetera, et cetera. But, you know, I think if you were to say to people, here's a really good sporting idea as an alternative to UEFA, as an alternative to this upcoming, um, expanded Champions League whose format we were looking at earlier today and going, what the, what? Um, 
you know, the, the, the idea that something could be an alternative to UEFA or whatever is not necessarily itself a bad thing, but it's got to be based on, um, sporting merit, sporting integrity, all of those kinds of things. And what's obvious and what's clear is that decisions are being made at the big clubs in Europe, the biggest clubs in Europe, Real Madrid, Barcelona, Juventus, that their their push for this Super League is not based on anything other than money. And that's, you know, pretty obvious. It's no surprise to anybody to say that. But I don't know how you expect to get public support for that when you have been, you know, a club like Barcelona who've who've put themselves in a financial hole and have done things and the the entire football world is going dig up stupid and they keep sort of digging themselves further into this financial hole and then they say you know what would be great super league because f- more football you know and and clearly it's just a way of of sort of bailing themselves out of the financial black hole they're in yeah, look, I I completely agree that there's nothing wrong with the idea of thinking differently when it comes to how you pitch sides against one another. That's fine. Mm. I think what was very obvious the first time around was that there was a level of desperation about what they were proposing, and it was very very reactive mm. and based around you know the financial situation post COVID, and. To a large extent, I think they, you know, they blew it. You know, strategically, they needed to have um, the biggest clubs across the top five divisions involved, and they managed to just about do that or get enough of them across because they really needed the Premier League, the, the mm. Barcelona's, the, the Real Madrid's, and whatnot. They needed the Premier League because the Premier League has got all the money, but they rushed it. Mm. They didn't think it through. They threw this thing out there and it was a laugh. You know, everybody laughed at it um, and quite rightly. Um, and I think their credibility since that point has been in the mud. And you've watched these three sides, Real Madrid, Barcelona and Juventus, trying to fight stuff in the courts. And then during that time, you've seen the entire board at Juventus effectively sack itself. They've had a 15-point deduction and Yelly, the fellow who was leading things on their side is out of the club so i don't exactly know you mm. know who's who's still fighting the good fight uh, on the juventus side of things at the moment florentino perez is going to be dead before this thing gets <laughs> off the ground and and barcelona uh yeah, as you say <laughs> digging themselves into a deeper and deeper hole by selling more and more of the you know they'll be selling the fucking trophies they've won sooner rather than later just to keep you know some of the players that they've got um it's it's a mess and the fact is that you know they the premier league clubs have signed all sorts of you know new agreements off the back of the punishments that were being threatened uh both at domestic and european level to to basically say they'll never get involved in something like this ever again um and I just don't see 18 months later, whatever it is, you know, two years later, that, that anything is going to change on that. I can't see them getting involved. Mm. So, and it already looks as if the European Club Association has rounded against them. The football supporters, federations from across Europe have rounded against them. I mean, it's it's, a, it's going to be a very, very tough gig for them to yeah. to, to, to get off the ground. And I'm I mean, not that concerned about it this time around. No, I mean, that's it. I mean, the the fine, I think, was something like 5% of our European revenue for a season. Was it something like that? I can't remember yeah. what it was. But, you know, the, uh, the Premier League clubs all had to pay this. They all had to rejoin the European Club Association again, I think. And they, like you say, had to sign pledges not to get involved in, in something like this again. But... It feels like, uh, you know, as the gap financially between the Premier League and the other big leagues in Europe continues to grow, and we can see that in terms of salaries, in terms of TV rights, in terms of spending, you know, the amount of money that the Premier League clubs spend in comparison to the other four leagues is is it's just crazy. So this is going to be uh, be a reality, maybe not for Premier League clubs, but perhaps... In Europe itself, this might be their way of trying to keep up with the Joneses, 
to an extent, you know? I mean, how do you do it in those leagues if if you don't have that cachet, if you don't have the, the pull of the Premier League? Yeah, look, I don't get me wrong. I don't I don't like the fact that the Premier League has so much more power than every other league because of its financial situation. And I mean it's 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 ridiculous the amount that was spent in the January transfer window. Mm. And you see someone like Chelsea come in and effectively spend what the, the the more than the combined total of four other top leagues. That's madness and that can't continue. That's not healthy and actually, you know, we need to figure out something you know, we need to figure out how to stop that from happening because it's actually only going to spend all of the money that's coming. All, mm. all that's happening is somehow, you know, all this money that's pouring into the British game or the English game is is just going straight out again. You know, it doesn't really make it much more profitable. I mean, obviously there are profits to be had there, but I mean, I, I do think one of the other things is when you look at the Glazers trying to get out of Manchester United mm. and you look at... uh you know, uh, John Henry kind of weighing up his position at Liverpool. I think in both circumstances, if those people thought that there was going to be a Super League that Premier League sides were going to get involved in, that that they would be sticking around, right? Yeah, they like, wouldn't I be just, going I'm anywhere, sure would they? Yeah. they? They wouldn't be going anywhere because that was the cash cow that they thought was going to, you know, really, really make them a mint. As it turns out, they'll probably make loads of money anyway if they walk away, it's particularly the Glazers. But yeah, we'll see. I mean, if if... If if there was some form of competition that took off and developed and managed to bring in loads and loads of money and it didn't involve the Premier League teams and then eventually the Premier League teams were lured, I just I just don't think there's enough I just don't think there'd be enough backing for a team that's for for a league that's got European credentials but doesn't involve the English sides at the moment. Yeah. Um, it's just a gut feeling. All right. Well look, we'll see how that one plays out. I want to talk very quickly about Arsenal, we're, we're not going to talk too much about Brentford per se because we will preview that game tomorrow over on uh, over on Patreon. But just sort of going back to Everton and the defeat and the performance and everything else, what kind of a response are you expecting from, from Arsenal? Because it is two games in a row now that we've lost. We lost the game against Man City in the FA Cup and I think that was an easy defeat, if I'm being honest, for many people to accept because... Uh, you know, the the sites are trained very much on, on the Premier League. But I think also losing to Everton was a big disappointment and perhaps a bit of a shock, even if we knew the ingredients were there with a the new manager and all the rest of it. So what kind of a response are you expecting from this Arsenal team this season, given that in the past we have been prone to the odds two or three defeat run before we get ourselves going again. There's there's not enough room for that, even if City did lose to Spurs. Yeah, I mean, uh, I think it's going to be quite a tense afternoon at the Emirates, actually, because I, I, I do think two defeats in a row, the fact we haven't scored in either of those games is going to be playing on people's minds. Uh, I, I, I kind of envisage it being a, a tight game. I mean, Brentford are in really, really good form. Uh, I think they've, you know, barely lost any games in the last ten, which is, you know, right up there with us, to be honest. Um, uh, I think they lost so their, yeah, I think their FA Cup game. I think if I just do this, yeah, I mean they haven't lost in the Premier League since October, but they did lose yeah. in the FA Cup against West Ham on the seventh of January. Yeah, yeah, but they've had some big results. I mean, mm. again, I, I know that you're going to cover this. Uh, on Patreon, but you know they beat City away. They drew with Spurs. Um, they beat Liverpool. So mm. I mean, it's not like they're doing it against average sides as well. They're 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 in form, and you know, Gabriel posted after the win at uh, Brentford earlier in the season. You know, didn't he the the nice kick out with the lads thing again? So again, we've <laughs> stirred the pot there, and we'll get even Tony. Well, they ready stirred to it tweet first. It back again. They, I mean, is this too good? This tweet is just going to go around in circles for years. Like Whoever wins, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, no, I think we just we just need to get back to basics. I think the atmosphere will be good because you know, after three weeks of no home games, people will be frothing at the mouth. Mm. Saturday, three p.m. That's a rarity. Yeah, new artworks up. I think people are kind of going to be in a, a big, big old mood. We know what the the job is. I think. Morale wise, the crowd is certainly being boosted by the fact that Spurs did us a favour. I think the players will have to have been. 
Um, and I just expect us to, to to get back on it. I think it will be tight, though. I'd love us to say, or I'd love to see a, a fast start and to be ahead at the break and all the rest of it. But I think it's going to be a real, we're going to have to grind something out. Mm. Um, and if we can do that, that's fine, because it immediately just stops talk of, oh, you know, three defeats, our Arsenal in crisis, that kind of chat that really <laughs> snowballs very, very quickly when you give it a chance. So, yeah, really professional performance I'm hoping for. All right, well... We'll see. We will see, of course. And uh, like I said, we'll talk about that game a bit more over on Patreon. That'll be available to you uh, on Friday afternoon. So tune in for that. Uh, Andrew, we'll leave it there. Thanks very much. Thanks very much. Catch you next time. You can find Andrew on Twitter at A. Allen Sport. He is at A. Allen Sport. So this weekend, it's Brentford at home. I'm going over for this game. I'm very much looking forward to seeing the team respond to the game against Everton. Looking forward to seeing them in person again this season and hopefully catching up with a few of you listening to this. We will, as I said, be previewing the game over on Patreon in more detail. That'll be available for you late Friday afternoon, probably around 5 p.m., 5.30, there or thereabouts. Myself and Lewis Ambrose will do our usual Premier League preview podcast. You can get it at patreon.com forward slash arsblog. Patreon.com forward slash arsblog. James and I will be here on Monday morning with an Arscast Extra. Fingers crossed it is a goodly morning. It feels like it's been too long since we've had one. After a whole season full of them, feel like pure shit, just want my goodly mornings back. So please do join us for that. In the meantime, have yourselves a great weekend. Catch you on the next one. Until then, cheers. Bye-bye. Uh, Hello, yes. Am I speaking to the financial manager at the football club? I am splendid. This is Mr. Carter calling you from Father B. Rogerson Arnold Underhill Delahunt, the accountancy firm. Just a very, very small query about one of the invoices that you've sent in. It's for £78 million. And on the first line, you say that £4.2 million are for services rendered to the football club. That then leaves a balance of £73.8 million, which you say is for... (laughs) I'm just wondering if there might be a little bit of a mistake. Yes, I mean, when you say... Do you actually mean... You do? Oh, I thought that was the case. No problem. We'll get that paid ASAP. The usual, non-sequential notes, etc. Perfect. Have a lovely weekend.